I'm just so excited um, about having Anthony here today. He's, uh, he's come up from Vauxhall, my end of the, well, my end of the, of the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Clapham. But anyway, um, yeah, so I'm really excited and I hope that you will be uh, influenced by his work, um, you know, come away and feel um, all uh, creative. Uh, and I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thanks. Hello everyone, um, this is quite interesting, I've been on a lecture in the room like this before, it's nice and old school, I like it. Uh, I guess I should give you, okay, two, two things to start with. My memory is quite bad, so I'm not going to read word for word from the sheet, this is just here in case I get a complete, utter blank head. Um, so do, you know, do bear with me a bit later on. And also, uh, I tend to, if I enjoy a subject, I tend to start talking quite fast. So if I start rambling on at a speed you can't follow, just say, slow down, just take it easy. Uh, and obviously art is something I do like, I do find a job on. Um, I guess I'll give you a bit of background on myself. Um, I graduated last century, which sounds quite uh, hard, but um, yeah, 1999, from uh, Winchester School of Art down in the South Coast. Um, I did a printmaking degree, specialising, well, I was a fine art degree specialising in printmaking, but we had a big a big old black and white enlarger there in a dark room, and so I started doing a bit of photography. And I think this was kind of the start of my love of photography, really. Um, I'd done one module on foundation, I think, uh, and I'd done a little bit of black and white before. My dad had an old pen Pentax. I remember when I was a kid, dad was always taking photographs with his old Pentax. Um, but yeah, I didn't really start enjoying photography until actually I got to Winchester. Uh, preparing for this talk has been a quite interesting exercise, actually, uh, and evaluating how my work's progressed. Um, these things are always quite useful. Ways of, it's always actually a useful way of looking back at your work, because you, you know you get kind of on this path of making work, and it's quite nice to have a bit of reflection and look at what you've done before. And um, I noticed that my work seems to fit into kind of two or three themes, um, you know, overarching themes, but yeah, two or three themes. So. I'm going to use those things rather than chronological. So most of it is chronological, so it, will be, it kind of follows when I first graduated to the present day, but it might jump around a little tiny bit. Um, and that's just because it kind of fits nice into things. Mm. So yeah, I've been making work 15 years. That sounds a long time, really. Um, and the first, well, this is kind of like an overview, a sneak preview. This is pretty much some of my practice, some of my stuff I've done. I'll, you'll see the slides in a minute, but this is kind of my work, I guess, in like one slide. Um, let's go to the first one. Okay. So I think it's best to start at the beginning. I've also got a slide projector just because I'm very, very old school and I like quite like slides. So I'm going to, for the first little bit, I might get between slides and the uh, digital. This is the screen prints I made in 1999, literally just before my, uh, this is not my degree show, but kind of around that time. And they're, they're based on photographs I took when I was on an exchange programme um, in Berlin, Czech Republic. And while I was, while I was there, I was just going around, you know, as you do, as you kind of, as a, almost like a tourist, just photographing loads of things. It was so different in 1997 when I was there uh, than it is now, I'm sure. And also very different to England. It was like, it wasn't quite, it was, you know, the, the curtain had come, had very much come up, and Berlin was well, well and truly gone. But, it did feel so, so different. And the back thing over there is like a giant kind of surveillance tower. And I had loads of these things left over from uh, the kind of Eastern Bloc kind of time. So and there was just this kind of uh, concrete architecture everywhere. Everyone looked slightly sad. It was very cold because it was early in February. So I just, it was, I took all these photos while I was there. And when I came back to, uh, my, to Winchester, I, start, I, I kind of flipped around with them, added a few extra um, elements to make them look a little bit more sinister, although quite a lot of them look sinister enough anyway. Um, so in case in this new one here, I've added a baseball bat, can't really see it, but I've made these kind of chasing people, one's got a baseball bat, in one, in one in the second I added like a gun in one of the shadows. So I just made the image look a little bit like I've captured something sinister. Um, and I laid these kind of forensic elements on top, on the screen prints. I called it Body of Evidence. I was like, oh, yeah, I imagined it as like a sketchbook from a, a policeman's notebook. Oh, that's my right. oh, right. that's not it. Okay, that's the next step. So, there's a couple more here. Oh, 
Um, there's a, that's a set, similar to that. So I had three, um, three backgrounds, black and white part, and I overlaid three different versions of these kind of uh, highlighting mark and the forensic marks on top on different masks. So this is a kind of classic uh, pixelization image, the note taking, highlighting areas. Then when I was very young, this is very early work. And then this is the one that I took from uh, a window of a uh, scene out stand up underneath me, and I kind of added elements into the shadows to make this like this kind of group was actually having an argument. I think they were gossiping in fact, but um, it was early morning. But um, yeah, so I had all these things and just to give just to kind of give you an idea that it was something more was going on than actually was there. Okay. Let's stop on that one. So that was the first one I ever did. Uh, just about that series, I'd, about that time I'd watched Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up. Has anyone seen that film? I'm sure some of you have seen it. Yeah. Have you seen it? So I kind of was interested in this um, idea of enlarging images um, and the ability of photography to kind of go into unseen detail and by close animation and by enlarging, enlarging. In that film, he also enlarges his photograph to the point where he notices there's a um, a gun in the in the in the, uh, in the head that he's captured. So I, I started doing I started going into the idea of enlarging. These this first series of what actually were smaller sections of photographs. And you'll see in a minute. I'm, I'm, it's the kind of theme that keeps on going through my work. So I called this first theme, I guess, uh, forensic evidence and the crime scene aesthetic. Um, I'm a big fan of the crime scene, uh, the look of the images, um, and. I'm interested in how you can change the tone of an image just by a subtle alter alteration, or sometimes you can just change the tone by a, a title. Uh, you know, people have done work where they're just taking photographs of quite innocent areas and change the title of what it is, and hopefully so you've got a completely different tone. So sometimes you can do a lot, sometimes you haven't got to do very much at all, and you can actually change how the, an image is per uh, um, perceived. Am I making sense so far? Yeah. Good. <laughs> I've got a lot of blank faces. Uh, so we might jump around a little bit from slide to digital just at the first bit, but bear with me because um, it will make more sense. In, in a minute, once technology takes over in the mid-2000s, like, mid I stop using slides, so I'm actually going to go back on, so I don't want you to see that, so that thing first just yet. Okay. In 2000, so I've, I've graduated by now, had my degree shown, hooray hooray, now I was a fully fledged artist. Thing. Um, and in 2000, I was uh, asked to participate in a show in Spitalfield Market, in a little gallery around uh, part of the market, which is no longer there, to be a shame. And the title of the show was DNA. I was given a title, and I said, can you participate in the show using this title? That's all I'm going to give you as a title. And inspired by this, and the fact that the, the gallery was about 200 metres from White's Row, where uh, Jack Ripper killed Mary, Mary Kelly, um, I decided that DNA, Jack Ripper, you know, it's quite kind of fits in my work. This is definitely quite, it's got crime scene written all over it. So, um, I made, my contribution was a series of black and white. Oh. Here we go. Oh! We're all getting the right way around. Okay. Here we go. A series of black and white photographs uh, that I spread all over the whole gallery. So. Um, they're on the floor, they're on the walls. There's actually two in that image. There's one on the floor in the middle of the, in the, middle of the slide, and there's one actually on the wall as you go down the stairs. So I, there's two floors together. I spent all these, a level of these photographs around the space. Uh, it was my kind of my first attempt at site specific work, I guess. Um, they were, the actual photographs were. I, exact black and white versions of the space they took up. So I went there before with the objects, obviously, took photographs, used um, uh, a very simple um, measurement device, blew up a dock at exact same size, put them in the same space. So to all intents and purposes, they were the same space they took up, except the photographs of the objects weren't there. They were just empty. So they were sort of exact facsimiles. Um, they were kind of proof to the existence of these objects being in that space at some point in, in the past. Um, by being in black and white, I kind of thought this seemed like past moments, sort of historic, um, and that, you know, undetected, they would have been forgotten. Uh, yeah, like seeing the space through kind of like a, a strange pair of glasses or something into the past. 
And it doesn't tie to the show's DNA. It seemed appropriate to turn the gallery into an imaginary crime scene, which is kind of what I did. I had like a little logbook that you could go around spot on. So they weren't all obvious. Some of them were one was on the back of the back of the stairs, all over the place. Uh, one took a couple of downstairs. Actually, when I was building the when I put the show in. There's one in the, there's a cigarette in the middle of the crack on the floor. It was great, the floor, someone had used the floor before the show, maybe used the floor, and put loads of uh, gaffer tape on down, so it had loads of scars. It was a perfect floor to work on, it was really nice. So it had all these marks on the floor. So it was really easy to kind of match up the uh, black and white photographs. Believe it or not, there is actually other work in the show, <laughs> although I've cleverly cut everyone else's work out. I mean, but yeah, there was actually lots of work in the show. And this one here, when I, when I originally took the photograph, when I came back, they put a wall right across where my photograph was going to go. So most half the photo was actually un, would, have been un, would have been under the wall. But I just thought it was quite nice it was poking out the corner. So that's actually a kind of key, or the end of a key next to the crack. So I called this series, it was called Lack of Evidence. So it's body evidence, no lack of evidence. Um, and the images are basically all I've got left because I, you know, I had to rip them off the floor when I took them away. A bit of a shame. There was one, that was the door as you came in, so the back of the door, I just I kicked the door, well, I basically stuffed my shoe with some uh, charcoal, kicked the door, took a fresh bottle of it, and then put a show the photograph of course. So actually, it's really such that one, but there was actually a photograph, I know you can, you can see it, you can see the edge of it just there. Some of them worked much better than others. Well, obviously, on the, on the brown floor, you could see it really easy, but on the white door, it looked you know, pretty much convincing, really. Um, the hardest part, obviously, was making sure that they were exactly the right scale. So I had to do did a bit of a test beforehand to make sure. But it worked out pretty good, actually, I think. OK, so that is theme number one. Continue here, yeah, OK. Uh, I noticed that I really enjoyed this way of working, so I, I really like being site specific, um, responding to just one theme, one idea. Um, you have artists that are studio artists, some people work in their studio and be the way. I've, I've done that in periods of work, but then you have other artists that actually respond to a brief, I guess a bit like a designer in a way, or an illustrator. And I realised that actually I quite liked, at that time, being given one thing. Rather than being said, well, make anything, my head couldn't comprehend that amount of possibilities, whereas if I was given a title, or even just just one little thing or a brief, then at least I could work within that framework and actually make better work. I mean, it doesn't suit everybody, but at the time it suited me. Um, and so I realised that I really liked this kind of idea, such as it and working to a particular brief. And then in 2001, uh, I was asked to document uh, the Barbican Centre. Oh no, it's not up there, sorry. Uh, I was actually invited to take to have a show at the Barbican Library, and I said, well, "Okay, that's fine, but can I take loads of photographs of Barbican? It's an amazing building. It's uh, it's full of um, amazing concrete underpasses, hidden kind of passageways. They gave me access to <coughs> areas, so I really got to go to everywhere. There's, a, there's loads of gardens. I've never seen the Barbican, but it's actually at the top. There's actually." Uh, um, greenhouses and stuff. It's, it's an amazing building, not just the public bits, but even the kind of uh, slightly sinister back alleys. I mean, it's a beautiful building. So, and they said, yeah, yeah, that's fine, you can just go to take the main photos as you want. Um, so, and I've always been interested in this building and this uh, barbecue anyway, so I've jumped to the chance, to be honest. Uh, it's quite a, yeah, it's quite a foreboding kind of place, I find, barbecue. It's sort of slightly uneasy when you're walking around, it's supposed to be like a utopia, but you feel slightly scared. I certainly would if I was out on my own at night time. Um, but yeah, it's a very kind of slightly scary kind of area of London. Um, and the grey images that I made um, with this kind of urban exploration urban jungle suggested this, definitely suggested this sort of sinister element. I think maybe it was my own slant as well, because I was looking at that in, in that way. So I decided then, rather than simply show the photographs in the library, that would be way too easy and also not that interesting to me, I wanted to invite the viewer to participate somehow. Um, and so this poster, we got it printed up and put it all around the Barbican, and it was based on a police incident poster that advertised the show, uh, 
and also suggested to the public, come and give us a hand um, and encourage them to participate. So it was kind of like a, an, an advertising as well as a, a, a call to arms, I guess. Um, and then, yeah, that's a very kind of uh, pixie image one of the ones I took. Some of you don't have any, I haven't got any slides or images of the actual photographs originally, but I'll show you what they are. I started, I realised that when they started making their changes, I really liked it, so actually I never, never showed the original photographs, but I'll get to it in a second. So, that, yeah, so I, rather than having this show, I wanted them to do something. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted them to do, um, but I wanted them to participate. So the, the visitors' library were given some opportunities to take part in this kind of pseudo investigation. And the way I did it is, uh, I gave them a box of the photographs, there was loads of them, and contact sheets and all sorts, put it in the library um, next to the CCD machine. I don't know if those things even exist anymore, but it was a bit like a market fishery there, and you could enlarge uh, documents and things. Um, I'm, sure that, I'm sure now we don't even use it, I'm sure we use something completely different, but at the time, the Barbican Library still had a CCTV machine, and also the fact it was called a CCTV machine, it just, it had to, I had to use it, it was perfect. Um, yeah, so the, and that machine was, you, you'd put the photograph in this kind of like, a bit like a fish, and it would instantly magnify it, and you could go quite close. Uh, and so, during their perusing, I got the visitors to, well, I encouraged them to write and draw and mark and highlight, a bit like my Body of Evidence series, um, onto, the, onto my photographs as if uh, like an officer working on a case. So, and the process was kind of like my thoughts at the time. I was looking at, um, uh, looking deep into my photographs. I just, I said, I just watched my fans around so you. So, you know, I was kind of obsessed about um, what could be hidden in the background of my images, what's on the periphery, what would, you know, what's, what, what I actually captured. Uh, and I let the public kind of decide, make their choices to what was important, what needed further investigation, what they thought was the key clue or something. Um, by the end of the exhibition, the, I will go to the next shot. Is it on here? Yes, it is. Yeah. By the end of the, show, uh, the exhibition, or I don't know if you call it that, by the end of the participation period, uh, the box photographs became a kind of visual diary of all their thought processes. Oh, uh, and yeah, there's, there's some interesting things came up actually, and interesting interventions from my anonymous, because no one left their names, so my anonymous collaborators. So I knew at this point I wanted their efforts to be seen, I wasn't quite sure how, but I sifted through the material, I recropped them, I reworked them, um, uh, and I, because they were, they'd been quite small, I actually enlarged them well, so I, this is actually, you know, again, I zoomed in a bit to the original image. Um, and I, I kept it deliberately small for them to have to zoom in. So all the photographs were actually quite small, so they had to look into it. I didn't make anything easy for them. They had, they had to zoom in. So yeah, I, I recopped them uh, and yeah, kind of reworked them. But I just felt just copying their marks was, wasn't wasn't really good enough. wasn't just didn't see. It wasn't conceptually enough either. Uh, so I need something else. And my solution was the idea of the ring. Because uh, obviously the circle of the ring is a common motif in surveillance, it's a common motif in police work, it's a common motif in um, ringing around potential suspects or ringing around a potential clue. It's got numerous, like numerous, numerous associations, especially, you know, it's on crime watch, we, we kind of used to seeing things ringed. Uh, and it also means things have become also quite ambiguous as well. It's quite a, uh, it means that things are ambiguous. Are they good? Are they bad? Should we be scared of this person, should this person be ignored, like, you know, when they're pixelated they they out, are they innocent bystander, are they an actual criminal? Uh, and then, obviously the ring, as you saw from my first slide, comes into my work later in mess boxes, for some reason I keep coming back to this idea of the ring, or the circle, but we'll come back to in a minute. Um, so, I wanted to make these rings, so to prevent to produce things photographically, I use a little bit larger, and a simple mask, hence why it's got that kind of funny, not complete outline, as you can see. So the outline's here, and then it sort of disappears over here. So I basically use the enlarger, so I put my photograph in the enlarger, uh, expose it correctly, slightly bit out of focus, put the mask on, and expose it again. So it was all done very much, you know, hands on. It's why it's not quite perfect. I, I quite like that. Definitely, they, they, they days before digital. Um, okay. There's another one. Bear in mind, I took all the photographs, but I didn't do the uh, additions. They were all done by the participants. 
I mean, I've recreated it, but that they, the person decided that these two having a conversation needed further investigation, and this, yeah, this is the fire exit steps. Um, okay, where was I? Um, yeah, so I thought, I was thinking that by blurring the background and highlighting the, or putting the, the red mark in the highlight, I was kind of bringing the, these bits of fork to the fore so that you would you know, definitely focus on them. It's almost like, um, you know, and, you know two, twice minding it. There's the focus point, there's the focus point. Um, you know, as if you weren't sure what the focus point was in this. Um, so yeah, really trusting the foreground. Uh, so, uh, this is, yeah, I'm just going to read this because this is what I wrote at the time. Uh, part of crime fiction, part surveillance style documentation, photographs and their additional marks alter our impression of these spaces, I think, uh, and situations. Innocent places become loaded with sinister undertones, uh, and minor details gain significance. One tied to the conversation between colleagues, in the can of suitcase or the fire exit sign, fire exit stairs, uh, have an added implication. And passing two strangers becomes an attention incident. So, I was just yeah, I guess it's kind of this whole kind of crime scene thing. That person who didn't like the guard, the um, attendant, so he decided to lay him out. That's not me, obviously. I don't know who me is, but it's definitely not me. And there's the two, two strangers in the suitcase. So yeah, I hope to exaggerate the sense of drama, as my, was what I was thinking at the time, by combining the marks, marking and blurring process. So, yeah, everything else was kind of irrelevant. This is what you have to focus on. And so I didn't show this work. I made it in 2002. Uh, 2002? Yeah, sure I did. Um, but I didn't actually make it. 2001. Well, I didn't actually, make, didn't actually show it until literally uh, 2011 when I was uh, set to take part in Bradford had, it's got a, a photo festival called Ways of Looking. I think the inaugural one was in 2011, there was one in 2013 as well. And I, this was set as part of a, um, a show there. And so 10 years, I didn't show it once, didn't even show anyone. So sometimes these things sit around for a while until they become more appropriate, I guess. Um, yeah, so it, it kind of, it lasted, it, it was a slow burn, let's put it that way. Uh, some, some titles come to mind, lack of evidence kind of said itself, body of evidence. This one I had no idea what to call it, so I just went for untitled. So just, I just struggled to think of a title for it and I had to have one for the show. So I just thought, untitled Barbican, ambiguous enough, doesn't say anything. But normally I don't call things untitled, it's very rare for me to say that. Uh, so, okay, so that is the first theme. So that was crime scene, forensic, um, so second theme. Surveillance, CCTV, pin on long exposure. Obviously surveillance covers the crime scene, but this is definitely, this section is definitely a lot more surveillance. Um, let's just quickly move on. Come on. Uh, ah. Oh. Right. I've already sort of touched on surveillance in the Barbican series, but um, this it's, yeah, it's a kind of natural progression. You're becoming more obsessed on looking at people, um, especially from this elevated viewpoint. I think that kind of that was the kind of key one, really, looking down these people. So, you know, I'm, I'm just where I'm going. So, there's a bit of a jump here. I did, I did do work between 2001 and 2006, but for some reason, we're going to talk about it in a minute, so I want to talk about surveillance first. But in 2006, uh, I started visiting and revisiting this a site in Milton Kings. This site here, it's actually the same site, two different projects. So it's a, it's a, I was kind of carrying out like a surveillance style kind of stakeout thing, kept on going back, just up for over and over again. I was actually with, with, uh, at home with my parents for a bit around that time, they didn't live too far from Milton Keynes. Um, and so I got to get go there quite a bit. But I've still been going there even up to 2010, even more recently than that, so I keep going back. I'm just obsessed with this, this part of Milton Keynes. Not Milton Keynes in general, it's a lovely place, but this bit particularly. Um, this this is called City Limits, um, which has got like this double meaning, limiting city and also the edge of the city, is how I saw it. 
Don't mind, we'll be able to pin out in a second. This is the last non pin out project. <laughs> uh, this, these are all located in Camel Park, which is in the heart of Milton Keynes, pretty much surrounded by the urban sprawl of Milton Keynes. Um, it's a space for outdoor pursuits, by this bit here is, and it's aspiration living, there's really posh flats, but amongst all this stuff, there's also this kind of litter with these like, leftover bits. Um, like a no man's land in this like it's a highly planned city, like it's a new town. Don't know knows has anyone been to Milton Keynes? Mm -hmm. Or you you know, you know so it's not that bad. Uh, I mean it's literally uh, the fastest growing it hasn't been the fastest growing city for years, but it's meticulously planned. And even though they've meticulously planned it, they've obviously meticulously forgotten it. Because this is very much it we was reading until recently, it's still left over. And it's quite a lot of land. They've just kind of First, it's got a bones a minute, but these bits here, they've just, just given up and thought, oh, whatever, we'll come to that at some point in the future. So they just stick up a, a fence, quite a you know, ridiculously small gate. Um, so there, so it almost like they've been forgotten or certainly been deemed worth doing something with at a, a later point in, in, in the future. So I, put, I probably took these at night, partly because I wanted to kind of show this idea of the modern city, it's very much a car-based city. I mean, most of the you haven't got a car, you don't get anywhere. The bus system is rubbish. It's all right, but it's just, it's not very uh, reliable. So you pretty much have to have a car to get anywhere. Um, and, um, and also because I always use my car, because I've got the idea that it looks a bit like trespassing, like I shouldn't be there, like I sort of come across it, um, you know, in the, in the kind of middle of the night. So I didn't, I want to do it at daytime, I'm definitely want to take it at night, and I realised that the car gave a kind of aesthetic that I was after. Um, okay. Yeah, as I said, I like these, like these very token gestures. This is definitely somewhere you shouldn't go blatantly because there's a massive gate and then nothing else. So, you know, I could crazy walk around it. But obviously, cars rule this city, so you can't drive there. It's a, it's a weird, it's Milton, it's very Milton Keynes. Um, so yeah, this just makes me more, even more curious about these spots. And these, even though they're sort of over the road from each other, it's all the same park, it's all Camden Park. And that's Camden Park as well. So yeah, just in case you want to drive to wherever that goes, which actually doesn't go anywhere, they put these massive bond lines up. Um, and they've been up for a long time. Uh, okay. So, and that series, yeah, I just call City Limits. But uh, I thought I'd take photographs of, oh, should I show you those yet? Maybe not actually, no. I won't show you a second. Okay, so this, this bit here on the projector, this was series called The Forgotten Quarter, uh, an obscured camera production. And I guess, I don't know why I really called it that, I guess it kind of sounded quite nice. So this is definitely The Forgotten Quarter, and the obscured cameras because all these trees and things are in the way. And I, I made them very much kind of quite, uh, I put the cameras inside the trees. This is my first, um, one of my first, was it my first pin? It wasn't my first pin on, but it certainly, we were kind of fitted in with the City Limits project, the same area. Um, so this was done in 2010, actually we've done it a few years later, but by then I was still obsessed with this part of Milton Keynes. Um, but this time I focused on one particular pocket of land. So rather than being like, I, I took loads of these nights from my own place, but I actually focused on one little bit. Um, and it's where they actually built carriageways, they built a roundabout, they planted the trees, they built everything. They built like lit literally an estate, but they just cut the, in the roads, they cut all the entrances. So there's no houses there, and the roundabout's obviously getting overgrown, and it's been like it for ages. So they sort of, someone had an idea to put something in there, and then obviously ran out of money or changed their mind. So it's this kind of non ghost, like a ghost town, it's like a non estate. It's quite strange, it's a really strange place. Um, it looks like it's been abruptly stopped in a way, like, it's like urban sports been sort of suspended. Um, yeah, and nature's definitely taking over. Come on, yeah, these trees are taking going wild, and the, the bricks are getting full of uh, flowers and all sorts and uh, foliage. So yeah, it's kind of just left its own devices here. Really. I think that's why I'm drawn to it. Um, for this one, I wanted to move myself, so I didn't want to be there like I was there taking photographs, because I heard there was some some dodgy activities went on there. Not that that was really, you know would really bother me, but I wanted to basically be, not be in the way. I wanted people to do what they were going to do or act as them without me being there. So 
um, being sort of guess, guess basically natural. Uh, and also been experimenting with miniature pinhole cameras, these, these little things here, tiny thing, basically things, film canisters, which I'm sure you've maybe used before. Um, has anyone used them before? Someone turn a canister into a camera? Is no, it a, I, 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 the girl with the Pringles. Oh, right, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah, same thing. I mean, I'm just, I mean, I'm so lazy. I, I mean, this has got to be very small, but this is water tight and light tight, so I haven't got to do any, any work at all, apart from cut a window in it and put a pinhole plate in. So that's just, just because I'm lazy, because um, they're, they're water tight and light tight um, already. And that's, that's the two things that, well, not necessarily water, but definitely light tight is the key thing for pinhole photography. And uh, they already exist, so, I, I kind of, and also because they were small as well, so they were, they were quite discreet. People tend to ignore these. I put them in lots of places. I put them on a clock tower in the middle of Crouch End High Street overnight. No one touched them because people just think they're just rubbish. So that's what's quite nice about them, they're very discreet. Um, so I'll get sidetracked here. Uh, where was I? So yeah, I was to remove myself from the post, remove myself basically from being there. Um, I've been experimenting with these, making these little cameras, and I made a few projects. So I distributed 19 of um, my film canister cameras around the whole park, uh, and left them there for 27 days. Ooh, this is what I need, this bit. I'm not sure all 19 of them. Oops. That's just a shot of the camera in the situ. So actually, quite blatant. I mean, they were pretty obvious, but people just, yeah, weren't weren't bothered really. So that's the, that's the roundabout. It's got the left. I got another one. Oh yeah. So yeah, this is all the different areas. As you can say, yeah, just a pile of soil. There you go. That will stop you from coming in. You can kind of see all these kind of. The roads, the network, and stuff, they just, just give it up. We'll just leave it. We'll leave it. Okay, is that going to stop there? No? Oh, yeah, there's one more. You get a lot of, I get a lot of internal reflection in these, kind of, these, these film canisters because the film, plate, the film plane is curved. So the light actually bounces in, internally. Hence why, I mean, obviously, I don't, there's not two suns. We don't live on, I don't know what planet has two suns, but we don't actually have two suns. But this is because it's internally reflected inside the camera. Um, and that's purely because it's, uh, it's bent around in like a curved film plane. So if we were to curve this back around the image, to, if we were to curve this screen, everything would go back to normal again, if that makes sense. Um, this is not a probably the best example. You'll see in a minute in some inside shots that the, the rooms get a very wide angle lens because just because of the curve. Um, okay, I'll quickly show you these. Uh, as you see, I didn't really catch anything that unusual. There was no unusual activity because obviously people would have to stay there for a long time. But I really liked the kind of aesthetic um, and the different kind of weird versionality. You get some very strange colours because of my exposure. You get some strange things with the sun. Um, I mean, my favourite is the first one. I really like the first one. Um, I really like that one just because it's just weird, really weird colours. Very strange colours. Okay, let's go back. Oops. Let me stop there. Okay. Um, but I think I'll quickly show you with more straight views just so you get an idea of how it looks normally. So that's how it actually normally looks. So it looks, you know. Like uh, most Milton Keynes, but maybe in the future. I hope Milton Keynes are post apocalyptic. It's quite weird. People, people start making sculptures out of the block pavements for quite a while as well. Um, yeah, it's got, like a, it's got it has definitely a post disaster feel about it, uh, like a crumbling civilization. So, yeah, we built all of these roads, we built all these lovely avenues, and then we blocked it off. Um, through, because that was 2010, I've been doing it for, I've been doing pinhole for about three years by that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, a lot of experimenting. And also, with pinhole, with long exposure, you've got a lot of scope. 
I think if you ask me back at, at the end, I will say, I will, we can go into more detail if you want, but um, you get, it's hard to explain, but reciprocity law failure, anyone heard of reciprocity law failure? Yeah, yes, well, it's not something that we really teach so much now, uh, what were these electronic classrooms, studio, yeah. so not a lot of, um, you know, you, is, you should say no. that it doesn't really doesn't come in. kick in. Basically, the film is guaranteed to be what you what it says it's going to be. So half the time, double the aperture, or double, uh, yeah, half the aperture, double the time. You know how the, the kind of classic exposure, so you know, one second, two second, uh, sorry, uh, eighth of a second, fifteenth of a second, thirtieth of a second, you know, and you make the aperture bigger and bigger and bigger. So as you increase one, you decrease the other, sort of basis of photography. And the film, the, the manufacturers guarantee the film to about one second. But after that, they have no idea. They can't guarantee that the film will do the same part. So normally it's a straight line like that, if you look at the, how film works. Exposure to aperture, so exposure on one part of the graph and aperture on the side, it looks like it diagonally cuts across. Once you get to one, it tails off, because they, don't, they can't guarantee that Two, two seconds or four seconds exposure is double two seconds exposure, or eight seconds exposure is double four seconds exposure because of the film can't work on that amount of time. They can guarantee it from a thousandth of a second or ten thousandths of a second to one, but they can't guarantee it after that. And then you bring in reciprocity law failure, which is a way of calculating long exposure. And quite frankly, it's a dark art. I don't understand it, but there's an internet. And there's a, sh there's a formal internet that tells you how many times you should do it. So, for example, I'll give you one example. That's 27 days, okay? So, I knew, I worked out, just from exposing my camera, looking at the light meter, what I thought it would, I would need, how many days I thought I would need exposure. And then I looked on the internet, on this is a special form, it, it said that I need to times it by 12. So I need to do 12 more times exposure than I thought I actually needed. So if I came to the conclusion I needed one day, I actually needed to expose it for 12 days. And so does that, does that make sense? So it actually tells you how much longer you need to do. And once you get to the, like, the realms of, I've done a long time, what I've done is like five, six months, no, almost a year. Once you get to that time, then you basically, if you think about it, if everything's doubled, so if, if you're using, using photography and you're doubled, so you've got half a second, one second, half a year, one year, is only actually one stop on the photography scale even though it's six whole months time. It's actually only one stop. And with colour film, you've got actually quite a lot of latitude. So, you could, I could expose it for one day, or I could expose it for 20 days. And that's actually only two or three stops, and both will probably be okay exposure. You'll have an ideal one, probably around 10, but the one day will be slightly underexposed, the 20 days will be a little bit overexposed, not very much. Um, so you've got a long, long lot of latitude in, in long exposure. I mean, there's, there's obviously a minimum amount of time you need for anything, like, like any kind of photography, there's a minimum amount of time you need to get the image to appear on the, in, the, in the camera. But after that, quite frankly, six months, even, even one month to, to one year is actually not that much difference. Because even if you double it, even without take, taking the risk of supposedly law failure out of the, pro, out of the equation, one times by two is two, times by two is four, times by two is eight. So one to eight months is actually only three stops. Three stops in color photography is not actually that of a, is actually not that much. Have I totally confused everyone? Yes. Yeah, it's not, that's actually not that far. When you're doubling, when you're using photography and you're doubling things, one you month to twenty. Again. You're doubling it again, so it's always, it's always doubling. Do you know what? I love maths at school, and I finally found a, a, a use, because most of, my, most of my time is spent uh, working out exposure. And even then, I can be quite, um, uh, what's the word, liberal. Mm. One, one thing that uh, occurs to me, mm -hmm. other than reciprocity mm -hmm. uh, effect, is that there is going to be a difference in temperature. Yes, of course. Uh, and yeah. film emulsion is mm -hmm. sensitive to... Oh yeah. It's, temperature to, it's, it's very sensitive to, to uh, temperature and it's also sensitive to humidity as well. So, and the cameras get quite hot if in direct sunlight, as I've discovered. I did a whole series of photographs once, thinking, yeah, yeah, I can do this now, this is brilliant, I'll do a project, I've worked it out, I can get this exposure perfect. Got the cameras back, three of them, the film was, didn't exist. 
totally disintegrated. And it's because they were into Excel and the emulsion had just slipped off the film. Mm. Quite embarrassing when you say to someone, oh yeah, I can do that. And then you wait six months and there's nothing shot. No, there's not even a film. It's not like I can develop it. There is no film. Like, it was just see-through. It was like the emulsion had just come off. And that's because it was in direct sunlight. And it was over winter and summer. So yeah, right, the, the temperature makes a massive difference. So you've got respiratory snore failure, but you've also got outside temperature, particularly cold winter. You know, they can't guarantee the film to work under extreme temperatures either. And these get... These are like little, little hot boxes, they get quite warm. So um, I've done some, well, I'm going to show you, I've done some work with, with behind perspex. I've actually opened up my cameras and they've been dripping. So they've been so wet, there's so much condensation that they've actually dripped and the, um, the contacts of the cap for the battery have actually rusted because it's just so wet. So I think that's why I kind of like doing this because as much as I think I've just about worked it out, Nature then chucks in another whole other problem. Oh yeah, condensation. Oh yeah, temperature. Oh yeah, time. Oh yeah, night time. So, yeah, that's what, that's what I kind of quite But, I mean, you will call Carl in a minute, you'll say the same. Does that answer the question? Ish. Ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, we can have something about more technical stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's funny, because normally I kind of focus on technical stuff, but I thought I'd be focused on the kind of reason, but reason, and we could talk about technical afterwards, I guess. Yeah. Uh, okay, so where was I? So yeah, 19 of these that were outside. And yeah, and, these, uh, and then we move on to the next project. So I've jumped back a little bit here. And the first two are about my obsession with Milton Keynes and that kind of forgotten area. This is um, this is pretty much I think my first major pinhole project. And it's a couple of years before the fossil was. Yeah, it's 2006. I've done I've done pinhole photography from around 2004, maybe even earlier, but this was certainly the biggest project I did. And it was, I was part of a, an art group at the time, you know, strength in numbers and all that. It's quite useful to know that you get more stuff done when you're with some other, other people. Individually, it's quite tricky, but you get a gang of you. People tend to say yes to things. You get a lot of people saying yes to stuff. Um, the fact that geography in our locations has spread, spread us pretty much around the whole of the country, otherwise we'd probably still work together. There's loads more people who said yes. We got so much more money and so many more grants and more shows when we had a group of us. Yeah. There's a lesson. Uh, anyway, okay, so um, so I was part of this art group, and also I guess it's an art, an art group as well. You've got a large your network is huge. So one of the people in the group, her dad worked for Cumberland Lodge, which is a um, it's in Great Windsor Park. It's it was the Queen Mother's, and the photo must be on the wall, uh, kind of her lodge, um, and that's like a kind of a busy conference centre, but not for like business, but more for like thinking. So they have like police conferences. Quite apt for me, and they have um, all sorts of kind of theoretical based conferences. With great minds rather than great economics, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, it's an unusual location for, for an exhibition because it was full of furniture and pictures of the Quip and the Queen Mother and various other things. But we thought, yeah, that's quite interesting to place there, so we did a show there. Uh, I decided that the majority of my contribution to the show, I did, I did like one other thing as well, but that's well, anyway, this is the most important thing. My majority of the contribution was to create like a CCTV network because basically it wasn't, they, they, even though they were in Great Winter Park and they were the, the Queen Mother's Lodge, and she did visit on a Sunday sometimes, there was no CCTV cameras there. It's almost like they were so happy, so safe. It was like, yeah, because it's in Winter Park, I guess. So there's no cameras there. So I thought I'd create this kind of like pseudo style CCTV network. Um, so I put up. Yeah. I've got all the, can you see the cameras in there? Quite subtle, can you see them? There's one on, there's two, one on each corner of the thing. Um, I put up all this network of cameras. Uh, but, it, yeah, I think it's also because it's a chance for me to work on quite a large scale. And also, let's get some, hopefully get some interesting images. But I, I position them kind of discreetly again, above head high, looking like a CCTV camera, in the corner of the room, and sort of definitely looking slightly downwards. Um, so, yeah, the mean actual surveillance kind of positions. I was kind of thinking where, where they put surveillance cameras. And again, they were distributed like most of the public areas. I had 13 total. They were exposing for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, for 17 weeks. Um, and just like in Campbell Park, they, uh, they, never stopped, they never stopped exposing. So that's, as I said, that was constant exposure for 20, 27 days. This was ex constant exposure for 17 weeks. Um, uh, so, as you can see from the images, 
not much happens, basically. Well, a little bit of stuff happens, but uh, I would say that months definitely, um, yeah, not much of a movement is seen apart from the kind of, it's quite invisible, because it's quite frankly, hundreds of people every month, every week, but really all that's, all that's kind of moved is the, most of the fabric's still there, so this is the chapel, so the chairs get moved out quite a bit, so you end up with like thousands of chairs, it's going about ten, but actually quite a lot of things, you get interesting sun coming in at various points, but it's open 20 hours a day, so it might have been sunny all the time. Um, so oh yeah, I need to kind of trace of human activity. Where's the next one? Oops. Is it going to the next one? Come on. Yeah. So that actually is a view from the camera on the right hand side. That one there is a view of the right hand side camera on that slide, looking at the left hand side camera right there. So, um, so yeah, not very much happened in that interval. This is more like this one of the conference rooms. So the chair got moved around a bit on the table, but. If you were to look at that at a glance, you'd think I took a pretty bad out of focus photograph for like one second, but that's 17 weeks exposure. Um, it's more obvious than some other photographs you see. And then that's the other side, so that's that camera over there looking at the other side. There's a little hint of the sun, a little, I don't know if you can see it, there's like a few streaks of the sun in that top corner up there, a little tiny hint. Um, Oh, please work. Oh, no, I'm done. Okay. So, yeah, so only the sort of really only the trace of activity that appeared really. Um, in like, yeah, routine furniture shifting, basically cleaning around, uh, repeating layer of the table. There's uh, another shot. So, this is, yeah, more the cameras around. Uh, this is like a kind of formal. It was it was it was a library. It was the whole house is the whole conference centre, apart from the bedrooms. Is, you know, a lot of it you can go to, but they didn't do much up there. I think there's more kind of formal eating up there. Um, you'll see from the image. So that's one of the conference rooms. So loads of conferences took place in here, but only a barely ghostly image of the chairs. You see no people, and then a few lecterns. Friends moved around. And the door opened and closed and locked. So the furniture in there. There's only actually one, um, there's only one music stand. But I quite like the fact there's loads of music stands. There's only, really, there's only one sofa, but suddenly kind of shift and moved around. So it almost, <laughs> I guess it almost becomes like, um, uh, like a brat painting or something. It's kind of every dimension of the same object. You know. Yeah. I think we've not got that before. That's kind of how it looks. I like the way that the chandelier is really clear in that photograph. Can I ask a question? Because I'm not a photographer and I'm struggling a bit with this. All dead, okay, yes. You, you said this was an exposure over 17 mm -hmm. weeks. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to catch a person yes. in there, would they have had to be in the same place in 17 weeks? No, they could probably have to sit there for a week, I reckon. <laughs> Mm. Okay. They wouldn't have to be there the whole time, but they would have to exist on a certain, in a certain spot, a bit like the chair, for quite a while, to at least to make the impression. Maybe if you had a security guard sitting Yeah, the I mean, if you had someone, yeah, yeah, yeah right. exactly. If right. you had someone, if it was more of a museum environment, and you had someone sitting in the same spot, yes, they probably would come out. Oh, uh, one thing I did say, that's purely practically wise, obviously, the ones outside, the ones in, come, come, in the Camel Park, and these ones would be overexposed because I'm working backwards. Even though, even though you've got most of law failure, uh, I, I'm doing the opposite. For most people, I want to slow the time down, and the only way to do that is you have to put filter over the camera. If you were just, I mean, I think inside you can get away sometimes with that, but not for the central roof. But you can get away with actually just having it open all the time, and it'd be okay. Um, as soon as you go anything outside, and you want to involve the sun. You have to then put. Uh, graduation filter on it, or if put ND filter on the front, neutral density filter, otherwise it will just be overexposed. So, so when I was talking about this, this most important law failure before, I'm kind of working backwards. I want to do a lot of exposure, how do I, how do I work out some exposure? Oh, I slow the, the, the photograph down by putting a filter in front of the camera, and you can basically layer it up. So like neutral density filter, 
worked by laying up. So sometimes I had six sheets of filter on the front. So the, filter, the camera, I mean, this one hasn't got any filter on this, it's a normal camera, but it would stick out quite a way. So I put loads of filter on it. And loose density filter works by halving the time. So you can get, diff you can get different grades, but it just changes the amount of stops the camera uh, exposes for. So you can, it's basically a grey filter in a way. Um, and it just lets, lets less light through. So you can, I can control how long I want the exposure to be by just putting more or less sheets of the light, the filter on. But what I start with, I always just start with how many days I want to expose for. I take a light meter reading of that location, either inside or outside. I then work out how many stops it is to get to that exposure. So say the camera tells me, oh, it's half a second. And I will expose it for 20 days. I work out just how many times, how many more stops there is between days. So half a second would be one second, two, four, eight, you know, keep going, doubling it up. Then add the less positive or failure in. Have I lost it one second? No, yes, I've lost it. Explain to me because I have stopped around a bit confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because if you're not altering the aperture, how are you altering the amount of light? Filter. With, with the new filter. Yeah, 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 get it now. Yeah, sorry, I should have yeah. said it before. <laughs> I missed that crucial bit of first that, didn't I? So yeah, so the aperture stays the same, and all I've got is time, and I've put the filter on it. Yeah, so I missed that kind of crucial element. Before. Well, I came in late. So. Oh, well, no, well, no, I think it was my, it was going to be me forgetting the important thing. Okay, so, Anthony, Anthony, also, yeah. like, for, for, for most of the guys in here that have done pinhole photography, mm -hmm. which is only a couple of They've actually been using film, mm. so we've been using papers. So hey. probably working, yeah, mm. uh, just black and white multi paper. Mm -hmm. um, because it's quite easy to to get through, get an image and so mm. on. Yeah, it's so, okay. so when you bring filming, which is obviously a lot faster, we're looking at rating the film around about two ISO or something. So yeah. you'll you'll bring into so you'll be using something like fifty ISO. Or, well, no, actually, I tend to use. Two, four, four hundred, or one, one sixty, or four hundred, depending. Right. So yeah, so the films are fast. Anyway, well, you, no, because as soon as you said these practical filters, it's going to be, it's got to be using that, or or yeah. you know, does it matter about the size of the lens or something? Yeah, so the lens is the same. Yeah, yeah. So it's not going to be that much of a difference. The hole does make a slight difference, but to be honest, I've made a lot of cameras, like seventy odd cameras, pin off cameras, little ones, and I've only got one beading needle. And depending on how long, how far I go through, the needle's got that kind of end to it. So my, my, I've actually measured with a, with a magnifying glass uh, and a wood that's got like points of a mil. And to be honest with you, my cameras vary between 0.2 of a mil for the yeah. hole to about 0.4. Right. And I've noticed not a great difference between, even though that's double the size of the hole, it doesn't make a huge, massive difference because it's, you know, it's only uh, double the size. Of, yeah, 0.2, 0.4, it's not double. It's not, it doesn't seem to make a massive difference. I think because of respiratory law failure, especially outside, because you're talking about a big latitude, it doesn't seem to make a huge amount of difference. It does if I'm going to be doing lots of short, if you do short exposures, yes it would. It could be a, could be a difference between taking a shot for half a second or like open and close without even doing it, you know, but I'm doing long exposure, so it doesn't seem to make that much difference. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know why I use 400, I'll come back to it in a minute actually. Does that, does that mean that all your uh, shots are uh, going to have enormous depth of field? In theory, yes. In practice, no. Uh, and I think the reason for that is because there's an optimum pinhole size for every focal length. And focal length, obviously, as we all know, I do not is a distance from the hole to the back of the film plane. So, so say that's your hole there, and your film is there, that's the focal plane. So in the lens, it's from the front of the lens, the hole, to the film plane. Um, the optimum size for this size of camera, I think it's, it's 3.5 centimeters, this will maybe, yeah, 35 mil distance here, maybe less, 34 mil. I think the optimum <coughs> pinhole size is infinitesimally small that I can't make it. So that's why they're blurred. Also, because they're just stuck up with some stuff, so they're, they're always moving around and people lock into them and stuff. So, I've never had infinite depth of field. I think it's because of, because I'm, they've been outside for a long time, they're moving around, and also because I haven't got the optimum pinhole size for the size of my uh, focal length. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. If you, um, you have a larger arrangement, like a, the Pringle cabinet. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Can I, can I just say so while, while we're on that, because I've seen the that we worked two. So I think, was it one mil hole? Did we use? Yeah, where is it? 
Well, we're working out from this formula, I think. Yeah, yeah. Is, that's uh, a long focal length. <laughs> the square root of the, uh, the distance of the focal length, the square root of the distance divided by 25, to mm -hmm. give you the, the size of the hole. Mm -hmm. We worked it backwards from the size of the so hole. So, the, the, yeah, yeah. So, working it out, we're yeah. hold it up. That's how it is. There you go. What, 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 As you can see, yeah. this is totally not the ideal box because, yeah, I'd have to be, well, my hole would have to be so small. Hair, hair like. However, saying that, it's, it's very much old, and what we used to have been old would have been very wide open. And it almost feels like a, it's it feels like a 200 mil length. Yeah, it does, yeah. Like so I guess you could, have a, I guess you, you could end up having quite a, a wide camera. Yeah. yeah. I hated that at school. Yeah. But trying to apply this, it comes down straight. Anyway, we'll put <laughs> We're almost there. We've got another one more set to me. Um, Okay, uh, where was I? Yeah. Going home, Sarah. So, so yeah, so, and this one here. Okay. So, I don't know what time it is, so I'm not going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Yeah. So, this is this room here. So, the camera's on, in that, on the buffer, the, the blind up there. And this is the table, because what you see on the light. This is what it is. Captured. So a lot of formal dinners, I think, um, which I quite like. But yeah, so lots of chairs. There's only like what eight chairs, ten chairs, but hundreds of chairs, loads and loads of lay, 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 laying tables. So yeah, so it was more like the trays basically than anything else. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so I kind of like this sort of semi-aerial view of the world, so kind of pinhole perspective, and the kind of quality images. You you kind of get from them. Um, I, I feel one of my contacts, I, I work up at Burley House, which is in Lincolnshire near Peterborough, um, and I want, they agreed to me to install some cameras there, and I kind of mostly did it because I wanted to see how difficult it was to this. Cumberland Lodge is very much a busy working lodge, working conference centre. Burley House is basically like a museum, it's like a national trust place, it's doesn't, static displays. And I kind of wanted to see and also, if there's any guards, if you know, people would come up, or you know, what, what, I, would, what I would get. Um, so I um, put some cameras and shots there. Where that? Oh, yeah, there we go. You can't actually really see that camera, it's up here. But it's not the best exposure you can see. It's there, there. Camera's up there. Um, you just might do. I just might do, yeah. <laughs> So that's the shot. Oh, So actually, these surprisingly, these were a lot crisper, and I think maybe I'd um, they'd be moved around less. So I think I fixed them down better. The other ones I just had stuck to the wall. Whereas this one actually I put on a solid because uh, there's loads of those kind of corners in. I stuck them on something solid, so I think that came kept them a lot uh, more rigid. So yeah, I seem to get a lot more detail, and also the Burley House is an amazing location anyway. Um, uh, so this was they were up for the entire season, and the Burley House season is 28 weeks. So up for, uh, again, exposing the whole time, 28 weeks. I totally it different to common lodge. Actually, it does because it looks like that. Literally, looks like no time at all. It could just be like a, 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 just a quick photograph. And I called these ones uh, a Burley well, a Burley season basically because it's a whole season. Normally, when I uh, when I subtitle to work, I tend to just call it a Burley season in camera or whatever. So I, I'm quite, I do things quite scientific in a way, because I'm almost like cataloguing. So, um, yeah, I sort of kind of favour this descriptive method of titling. So I'll have a title of the show, of the series, I know, Forgotten Quarter or Lack of Evidence, and it would be camera four, or in the case of Lack of Evidence, it was actually the name of the number of the neck. So I do kind of a quite a catalogy style of um, uh, titling. Uh, yeah, for scientific, it's quite slightly scientific. Let's see if I can get through these. So that's another one. That was the, that's the orangey garden. So that's the only one that actually had a lot of movement because that's the restaurants. So those like little bits of light that you can see, that's all of the backs of the chairs, I think. Catching the sort of silver chairs, catching the light. Oops. I missed one out there. I think I like that. That's the Hellweed, which is. 
that camera up there. That's what that captured. <laughs> Do you know what? I can actually see the camera. I mean, Bertie House it, it itself is an amazing, amazing, I mean, it's very photographic. So I've got to use it as a way of photographing the, photographing the architecture. And it has loads of really nice windows and shadows. The camera's actually there. Oh, just there. But, um, so, yeah, I've mean, just kind of like taken images and it's got all these kind of amazing staircases and stuff. So this is, a, this is one of the displays. Pretty much. I don't know why this one's so blurred, actually. I think this one might be not. There's none of this blurred. But there's two ropes, and that's the only sort of... That's the only sort of chains. Everything else should really be in the same place because they don't even move their uh, their items. They kind of keep it quite static. And then they've obviously polished the uh, these are jelly rolls and stuff on the tables. This is the grand kitchen. Um, now this is the camera which is above. Uh, yeah. Okay. The fourth um, frying pan on the top shelf. There's a little tiny camera there. Can you see it? It's quite subtle. You see it? Yeah. It's kind of in the shadow. You can see like, the, the glint of it. That took this photograph. And then you'll see the, the moose because... Oops, come on. There you go. That one... Oh. Look at that. Stop it. There go. Yeah, that camera, which is uh, on the main pillar. Somewhere over there. Yeah, it's quite... It's a bit subtle, actually. This is it's quite small. And was there, it was right in the red corner. That took this one of the uh, moose. But this is again, this, this is the sun uh, through the windows, and then that's an internal reflection. So it looks like a whole other window, but actually it's just sun reflecting inside the, inside the canister, inside the camera. What camera did you use to record the camera placement? Uh, I just used my um, Minolta X7. Yeah, just a film, a normal film camera. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll use. Uh, but yeah, just a normal Minolta 1980s. Mm -hmm. I think it's X X700 or X7000. Anyway, it's one of the Both will do. What's that? Both will do. Yeah, no, they're nice. They're nice, nice camera. Um, okay. Do I have much time left? I might jump ahead if I don't know what time it is. My phone's turning stuff off. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll rattle through this a little bit just because I really like these photographs and then we'll go on to the, the, the last bit. So, oops, these were taken. I don't think it's actually on the slide, I think that's it for slides. Oh, yeah. All these, um, these were taken, again, it's not a pinhole project, it's not strict surveillance, but it's taken in, um, in the rural, in the Caribbean region of Canada, uh, in a place called Big Bar Lake Ranch. And it's uh, kind of an area of gold rush. Era was kind of the mid 19th century is where it was populated mostly, and that's kind of it's like sleepy and you know, it's very much cattle area. It's about five hours north of, uh, sorry, five hours east of Vancouver. Um, and in 2011, I took some photographs of the this ranch that's basically derelict. And the reason why I've included them, is, I think, it's just because it starts to kind of get bring in kind of love, my love of stuff, sun trails and stuff. Um, the camera, like I used the, there's hundreds and hundreds of holes in the roof and I used the, these, all these hundreds of holes in, in this roof to kind of light the space over the course of four days. So normally there's just there seems to be lots of dots everywhere, um, but obviously over the course of the time and it, it translated into all these lovely lines and then turned into like bands because there's quite a lot of lines. Yeah, I, 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 was, I knew I wanted to use the available light, and I didn't. I wanted the condition of the building to actually dictate it. So I got the idea that it was the sun inside the building uh, that's created with all these lovely sort of streaks. That's not how it looks. It actually just looks like a normal room, very dark, dingy room with lots of little dots everywhere. But then, obviously, over the course of the four days, the dots yeah, turned these lovely lines, and also the sun moves around to so get the rafters and shadows and stuff. So you, you couldn't get this. You couldn't get this image in norm, under normal conditions. You can only get it under long exposure. It, doesn't, it wouldn't happen like this. You can't see it like this. Um, so yeah, the sun's illuminated through the windows. It's not through windows, but actually, yeah, through all these hundreds and hundreds of dots. Someone told me once that they look a bit like underwater, especially this one. Where is it? Where is it coming? 
Yeah, that one there. They said that it felt like underwater. I think it's kind of slightly bluey hue. Um, and you've got this kind of fisheye, fisheye wide angle style because of my um, canisters. So you end up with the walls end up looking like they're slightly curved. I mean, they are curved in the photograph, but if you were to bend the photograph like this, they would go back to the nice straight lines again. Um, so yeah, they just kind of has that kind of ship that look about the moment. I think I was drawn to this site, this big Bar Lake Ranch. Um, I think I was drawn to it, I mean, kind of a bit like I was drawn to the two games, because they're sort of modern, they, they've kind of got a mystery to them. I mean, I know the history of this place. I know it was a cattle rancher, and I know, maybe even know the guy whose ranch it was. Um, I don't know personally, but I know his, his wife was still living in that area, not a long ago. But, um, it has a certain because it's kind of strange, it's sort of been left, it's a kind of modern, it's a modern ruin, I guess, and it's kind of been forgotten. But, so I wanted to catch it before it falls down, it's because it's ca uh, Canada, and because it's very wet, it's not that wet, but it's just very kind of, um, well, basically nature takes over things in Canada very quickly, because most things are fast made of wood, so it's not going to last very long, so I kind of wanted to catch it before it fell down, which I'm sure we'll do very, very soon. So there's the ranch, with the sort of the sun, all day sun in the corner. Oh yeah, that little funny cutout in the corner, that's because I use bits of 5.4 film. That's what I was going to tell you later. I cut up bits of 5.4, and this is obviously the bit that's got the vegetation. Uh, and then these holes here, which we mentioned before, when they develop them, so I don't do colour, but when they develop them, they have to obviously pull or clip somewhere on the negative to develop it. So that's the bit they grab. So you end up with these kind of like line of holes, but I quite, you know, it's all part of the process, so I show it with everything else. I don't, I don't cover it up to show it. Okay, the last little bit, this is the last section. Uh, time lapse the moon, I call this, and DIY aesthetic. And I say DIY aesthetic because there's obviously a lot of exposure, and time lapse has got a lot of um, kind of overlaps. Um, but this, this definitely is just my love of objects. I think making hello cameras is sort of this hint to it, but I really, really love the idea of this photographic object or the sculptural object. In digital photography, you don't have a, you can sometimes never print a photograph, whereas I can really man and get work in my hands, doing stuff, making stuff. Um, and so yeah, hopefully I'll just sort of what this will demonstrate my love of, of the made things. Um, the, uh, go back to my keys again. This is a fir my first ever attempt at um, nighttime photography. So Obviously, uh, nighttime photography has a whole other problem. Uh, not only have you got to cover the, the camera during the day, you've got to think about shutters, you've got to think about um, uh, not overexposure. You don't want, you know, as soon as you basically, as soon as uh, you saw before, the other photographs had sun trails. To get moon trails, you have to completely cut out any sort of sun, otherwise it just bleeds it out. The sun is a lot stronger than the moon, so. Um, it's, it does pose quite a lot of interesting challenges, um, but I'm a real, I, I, I just love night photography. I really like sodium lighting in urban scapes, as you saw before, city limits. I really like the moon. Um, oh yeah, just I love the moon, like moon in landscapes. I, really, I just love the moon. So I knew I wanted to take some photographs at night time. So I decided to expose these for one month. Why choose one day? That's too easy. One night. Because I've done single night photographs before, where I stuck them on my the windowsill and just done that way, it's easy. But I thought more challenge is get it outside, get it somewhere I don't live. So this was my first attempt, this is my Mark I time lapse pinhole camera. And basically it's a cheap alarm clock, a couple of Maplin's cogs um, uh, to create the mechanism. Obviously uh, you can't see on this way to go off, but I can on this one. So there's two goals on the front. So this was on the clock face, the hour hand, double size clock cog, 12 hour, 24 hour, simple. Um, I say simple. The clock is not designed to take that amount of weight of cog. So uh, it was Mark 1 for a reason. It wasn't exactly massively successful, but this is the photograph I got. Oh no, that's the nest box I put in. Oh yeah, as I say, the reason why I chose nest boxes, I think, I guess it's quite obvious. Um, they're, they're basically things the public is seeing, they generally ignore them, so sort of, I guess hiding my work in plain sight. 
you know, you see a nest box, you can say, oh, it's the, it's the birds, it's not, for, it's not got cameras inside it. You can see the fun of it, actually, it had, there's a bit of, it actually has got a bit of plastic on it, so you can first kind of nest anyway. Okay, this is, that's the shot I got. Quite an abstract shot, as you'll see. Um, but that's the moon, I did get the moon in the very corner of the image. Uh, and this is actually the same as the camera 7, the one from before, so this is the same view as, particularly, as that day, night, oops, night, day, night, day, uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, so I really, I just, I love, so I love making some, I really like the challenge, I think that's what people do pinhole, because I like the exposure challenge, I like the making challenge. So, um, in 2011, I was selected to take part in the Format Festival, which is in Derby. Now, normally I send existing work, but I just thought I've had loads of trouble getting permission to show my nest, to put my nest boxes in the public. For some reason, people didn't like the idea of me putting nest boxes outside. Mm. I thought they weren't pleased about me putting cameras, because they didn't quite get the comprehension idea that people wouldn't be seen. But as soon as you said to any kind of council, oh yeah, I've got cameras in the, in the parks, they sort of go, well, hang on a second, this is, you know, privacy. So I tried to show that, explain to people that actually, unless you, activity that you did in that park at night time was there a lot, you aren't going to be seen, but it's quite hard to explain. So this is brilliant because, because I got into the show, and I, did, I sent the proposal and I accepted it, I got the full backing of the council so I could put it anywhere in Dalek, so, and they actually encouraged me to do it. So that was good, this was an opportunity for me to do something which everyone else had said no to up to that point. Um, they were quite relevant, but it's good thing about Dalek, they weren't relevant, which is nice. Um, so my contribution to this was a month of nice Dalek, is what I called it. And again, I put them up for one month before, and I attempted, I attempted to capture the night activity of Derby, a bit like these ones in the, in the Common Lodge and in Burnley House, that was sort of like human activity, sort of trace of it during the day. This was going to be the trace of night activity, obviously, apart from the moon and a little bit of snow and condensation, people don't really show up, not in this one, I do it in a couple more, but you know, I was kind of interested to see how it would work. Now the difference with, with these particular nest boxes or these particular mechanisms was that I installed 24 cameras, and by then I was found a 24-hour clock, actually, that was on the market. The Germans make it, obviously, the Germans make it pretty good. So the Germans have invented 24-hour clock, well, not invented, but uh, they make this 24-hour clock. So no more cobs for me, no more problems with that. Um, and, so, and, I, and so I installed two sets, because I had 24 cameras, but basically I had them open for one hour a night, each, ca each uh, mechanism, between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. But rather than only out for open for one hour, so one camera, which could be not camera, which, which one this one is actually, in fact it says here. This one is camera 34, this is Cathedral Green in, in Darwin, this was open between 1 and 2 a.m. every night for 30 nights. And then this one here, although that's set to a camera. So there's my camera stuck to the side of the 24 hour clock. That's my shutter mechanism, that's one hour, 15 degrees of a um, that's the nest box, and then that's an image of the camera in there. Does that make sense? It's quite basic, really. It's basically a 24 hour clock, a camera stuck on the side, and a shutter going around the outside of it. Very, very simple. Highly technical. There's one in, in that's one of in Derby. One guy said to me, ah, oh, they're quite large for nest boxes. What birds are you going to be nesting in there? And I said, oh, they're for squirrels. Mm -hmm. And he totally, he totally <laughs> thought I was out of something before. And he walked away. I was like, he, he, he thought I was lying, or he just accepted that was the case. Yeah. Um, so, and this one here, that one is, um, that's, that's the same cathedral green, and that's between 8 and 9 p.m. So you can actually see people's footprints and stuff. Oops. Oh, no, it's not been that thing like a big stop. Um, you see people's footprints in the frost. So this is this, this, this exposed between 8 and 9 p.m. <coughs> every night for 30 nights. And this next one, that was, this is in Bold Lane Car Park. 
and it's eight to one kilo as well. So I had, I literally had two cameras that covered each hour, as it were, that distributed around the whole of Derby. So you can see like the car trails and not sure what um, this is, random or all that stuff is. But that's what's nice about the you get these things which you're not expecting, you know. Um, Okay, that's the marketplace, and that's between six and seven. So you can see it's early, this is winter, it's quite like Christmas, so sun's set maybe an hour or two before. So you've got kind of a nice blue kind of sky. Uh, Christmas decorations everywhere. Sort of bits of snow-ish. Um, yeah. And, and again, because of those nest box, I've got the circular motif that goes back to my stuff from my beginning. So I've got this thing about the circle. This is kind of nicely frames the work in a way. I use it as like a framing device. Okay, which one's this one? Again, it looks too good to me as I could not take a photograph of it right next to the CC. You know? Oops. So that is the shot that what that camera just took. So this camera here took this photograph, and that's of the church, and that was between 11, 10 and 11 p.m. So they're all they were they're all open for one hour each night, like the segments, and that's that little tiny slit that you saw on the camera. That's the same camera, so yeah, so this is, this is Bold Lake Car Park, quite a well-known car park in Derby, it's actually quite famous. Um, for being one of the safest places in the world, supposedly. Uh, yeah, so that's the car park, and then this, that, that camera in the top corner here, this little one here, this is the view that that camera took. Not actually that different, really. I mean, not a million miles away from that, there's the, oh, there's the yellow marks, there's the yellow marks. The reason why this is a bit weird to face upside down is because halfway through installing this, or halfway through the exposure, I came back on in the end of uh, well, the early jam, and a squirrel had bitten through my uh, camera tie. So the camera was facing down for half the time. So obviously he didn't like this intrusion to his, his territory. But I still got a photo about it, so I was quite happy about that. And that's just one of my favourites. <laughs> and then that's the car park the other side. That's another one of the probably. So yeah, I chose the location because of like the cat, because of famous landmarks, activity, you know, different types of activity might happen. Again, you can see cast trails and stuff on the side of this, and the cars driving past. Um, and yeah, and sometimes if there are enough trees, because as you saw, my cameras were quite large. I took up quite a lot of tree, a lot of trees in Derby. There's not a lot of particularly uh, mature trees, so I had to kind of pick and choose the ones I was going to use. So actually, that tree you can see ahead of you here, this tree here, with this car park behind, is actually, um, has, a, has got a camera on it, you can't see, but that's that same view, so that's the view of the standard camera. Um, there's a, yeah, I have two, two in the same spot. And then that's one, it's a very, quite an abstract one of the, of the roundabout, it's quite hard to tell, but there's a, there's a uh, traffic lights, and then the, the roundabout's just here. But I quite like that sometimes they come, come, quite, come out quite abstract, so that's what I like about Pinhole. You know. Okay. Ah. Nearly there. Almost finished. Um, so, and this was how, how we showed it. We showed it from Kit the Taz Museum, which is in Derby, and um, we didn't want it to be just a load of postcards on the wall. I don't actually think it's kind of standard. And we, I had to use the cabinet somehow. So we decided to use, to plot the cabinet's cabinet to make them look like giant nest boxes in a way. But rather than have the camera, before the portal was used to take the photograph, we thought it would be good to, for people to peer in. So we used the sort of circular device again, had the photographs inside these cabinets. And so we went to a space, you just kind of um, confronted with this network of like maze-like uh, cabinets. And so you had to appear in to see. You, you didn't actually see, you couldn't see any photographs. So you know, it's a photography festival. You couldn't see any photographs when you first went in, and it kind of made you. And that, well, we hoped it would make you peer in because you could see the uh, the light. And yeah, people pretty much did that. So they were sort of yeah. Um, we used a kind of motifs from the nest boxes. This idea of peering, it's like looking in. Um, at least in the show. It was yeah. I, I, it was a little bit kind of mischievous in me because I, I wanted. To, I wanted it not to be photographic. I didn't want it to, because the whole show is just full of photographs. And after a while, you can get a bit bored from seeing photographs in this frame, another frame. So we said, let's make it a little bit different. So my view is slightly mysterious, but I, w I, didn't, I didn't want it to be confronted with a photograph as you walked in, instead of made it into insulation, which I think actually, it looked really nice, actually. It was very hard to photograph because it was so dark in there. 
I mean, it was pretty dark with just these lights coming through the coming out, this, this light coming out of those uh, boxes. Um, okay, nearly there. Uh, I did make a book from that project. So my first self-published book, and I yeah, and that, again that kind of falls into the kind of making uh, object-based stuff. I really like. Those. I think photo books have got have had a real renaissance of late. I think photographers are realising that you know the photo object is almost you know is, is a nice thing to have, and uh, a lot of people do. I mean, the sort of photographers that just make books and don't actually do any work, uh, do any actual printing. I mean, um, it's a guy who's in the kind of who was in the uh, Brighton Photo Annual last time, not the one recently, but one before. Who literally made his whole name just making self based books. He started exhibiting now, but he hadn't exhibited me, he just made his own books. Um, and I think, yeah, this is definitely my love of the photographic object. Um, That's Stephen Gill. It is Stephen Gill, thanks for being my memory. Uh, yeah, he, he's, his books are brilliant, they're really good. Um, so, okay, so that's. Pretty much almost everything. I'll do the last little bit, which is more of kind of a, just how, where I am now. Uh, I've done some trials, that's easy, and I said that's quite simple in a way. Or, like, you know, if you point a camera outside or point it a window, you'll get a sun trail. Moon trails, that's much more difficult. You've seen a couple in the Derby shots. Um, I mean, the motivation for that project was more that I wanted to get some shots outside and use the trees in Derby. But then I realised I was capturing the moon, I was like, oh, I want to get more moon images. So the next, this is Mark. Three? Was it Mark Four? Um, this is Mark Four pinhole box camera, uh, Timex mechanism, and it's purely want to get the idea of the moon. So again, this is an, uh, uh, an hour, as you can see, but the tiny that particular photo is an hour. But um, yeah, I, I really want to focus on sort of moon trails, but it's quite it's it's, an inter it's quite a hard thing to do. It's really it's uh, really challenging. I mean, I've always been fascinated by the moon, it's, you know, the space race, the um, it's history. It's got so much myth. I don't know. I just love. I just love the moon, and the fact that it, we only see it because the sun's there. Quite like that. It's, it's only there because the sun shines on it. Otherwise, it would be a dark shape in the sky. We'd never see it. Um, so yeah, I just I really I just I really love the moon. I've become quite obsessed with it. So this is my next nest box camera. I, I, I used again Burley House, so I put some of it Burley, in the Burley Gardens, full of condensation. So I'm like, it's quite hard to combat really, but that's Burley House. It's, a, it's actually very nice building Burley House. What was the explosion for that? The explosion, explosion for this was five months. So I had them in the gardens from November 2012 until March last year, 2013. So they're out for five months. Um, and I really tried to simplify the design. You saw it. All it was, I just had the, cl the, the clock with the mechanism on the top of it, and then the camera hung down from the above. And then it, so the, the clock wasn't actually attached to any of the, kind of, uh, sorry, the camera wasn't attached to any of the mechanism. Whereas before, I had that big thing going around it. It just seemed to be too much stuff to go wrong. This was. I mean, I've even got a newer bit more, which is even simpler, but this is literally just shutter, clock, camera hanging down, that's it. And the thing just rotates around it. So just to, to try to simplify it, try to make it work, basically. And these are the photographs that I got. So that one there, that's the camera that took that one. And a lot of people think these are sun trials, but I promise you, these are just the moon. I know that seems not that exciting, but to get the moon trail, Really, really hard. One moon trail, easy. Anyone can do that. Because it's loads of things, it's just thousands. But to get five months of the moon is really hard. Well, unless you've like, got millions of pounds and you work at NASA. Um, and as you can tell from these photographs, the beginning and the end is daylight. This is daylight. And that's because, because the shutter, okay, say that's the camera. Because I had the shutter kind of coming around and doing that, and then, and then closing up again, when it, I started the exposure when the shutter was exactly in front of the camera pinhole, so the holes here in the nest box. But actually, when it started coming around and my exposure started doing that, the light crept in on the side and at the end of the day. So this is basically the beginning and end of the day. So it's like just so I've got a little bit of light squeezing in day before actually the exposure was supposed to start. Because too much light came in the corners. 
Um, so this is why I've got almost daylight here and almost daylight here. But actually, I quite, I quite like it. I mean, I've, I've, now I've got, a, now I've got a new camera which doesn't won't have that at all. But um, I was, yeah, I sort of it was a bit of a surprise. I wasn't expecting it. But um, yeah, so I actually managed, I managed to get day and night. And what I quite like is the moon actually goes into the daylight. Or I guess it's not even that, it's probably when it's uh, sunset but not pitch black outside. And then this is a reflection in the, in, the, in the lake of the moon above. This is a reflection, which I quite like as well. There's another one. So that's, yeah, the moon as it goes pitch black. Okay, this is the last bit. This literally is the last thing. So, uh, yeah, kind of, I think I've said it a few times, I do like making stuff. <laughs> Um, and I've, I've kind of accumulated quite a large uh, amount of redundant nest boxes, mechanism, you know, each time you go to the next version, the other one's kind of sort of like scrap. I don't scrap it, I keep it for something. I knew I was going to be using something. So I've got this sort of like pile of old nest boxes and pile of old mechanisms. And I thought, I want to start using these in my practice, because actually, exposing calculation, working out the time lapse stuff, Making the mechanisms is probably 90% of my practice. The actual camera photo taking section is very minimal, and even then, nature doesn't work. I install them and then let, leave them there. So, as far as this is one way, the t-shirt face is the anti-photographer because actually I don't really do a lot. I sort of set the scene up and let let it happen in a way. Um, I'm not behind the lens because there's almost a lack of author in a way. I'm not there at the time that the thing's taken, I'm very much removed from the process. And likewise, in my practice, most of the most of my practice is taken up with making things and preparing and calculating, and a little bit of it is actually photography, which is why I call myself an artist photographer. Because I see myself as, you know, making things, really. Um, so with this in mind, there's a show at Burley every year, and they have like a sculpture show. Obviously, you know, I'd like to be a sculptor, maybe I'm a frustrated sculptor. So, I wanted to show you these photographs that I took there. So what I did was I turned the nest boxes that I used, the Mark IVs, into uh, little lunar light boxes. And by that I mean, there's a little button here you press and it, light, it lights up. So it's actually inside of the nest box that come like a light box. But it's, because it's outside, I've made it sort of solar powered. So there's like a, so you can't see on this, but as I did this before, but underneath it there's actually a solar panel. So, um, the idea is that I'm going to install them in like a cluster of tree, like a tree, maybe two or three trees, uh, where you can see them, obviously not out of reach. And so you can press them and then the solar panel will keep recharging the battery of the, of the, of the, light, the light box. Uh, yeah, and I've called this um, the Rhythms of the Moon. And actually, I've, anyway, I've called this, this project, or this particular work, Solar Lunar Sea. C spelled S E, obviously. Sea, as in lunar sea. Um, not that clever, but I thought it was quite clever. Uh, and, um, and again, yeah, just, just like in, uh, in my you know, life, the, the, I need the sun to reveal the moon, so I'm using the solar panel, the solar power to, to reveal the, the, sun, the moon trail. And that pretty much is, is up to date. That's it. That's it. Excellent.